Right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on the update on COVID-19 therapies. I think we'll give it just a minute to allow other people to join. I see that uh, a lot of people are joining in. We'll be starting shortly. Perfect, I think we've got uh, critical mass and I think we can start. Again, welcome to this webinar, which will give an update on COVID-19 therapies. My name is Sibusi Social Travel. I'm a country representative for PAD and I'm also a director of external affairs of Caribbean for PAD. Welcome again to this webinar. As means of mitigating COVID-19, uh, a strict vaccination program is key but are also aware that uh, vaccination decreases uh, severe hospitalization and death. Thus far, South Africa has uh, administered more than 30 doses of the COVID-19. And as of February 12, 42% of the total adult population was fully vaccinated with 47.2% having received at least one dose. This is still short of the ideal aim to vaccinate 40 million South Africans. To achieve herd immunity against COVID-19, a substantial proportion of the population, about 67%, will need to be vaccinated. And there are, there are several therapies that are currently in use, uh, which are aimed at uh, tackling COVID-19, including some that are called uh, the COVID-19 pills. However, there is also a lot of unknowns and a lot of misinformation that is going around. And so this webinar will serve as an opportunity for an expert panel discussion to share scientific evidence and regulatory guidance in terms of uh, COVID-19 therapies. This will help in terms of addressing issues such as fake news, myths around uh, COVID-19 uh, therapies and vaccines, and also will address issues around uh, hesitance on vaccine. It is such platforms that serve to provide the much needed information and guidance in terms of uh, what South Africa is doing and what the country needs to do as we move forward. The objective of this webinar is to update the public on the latest trends on COVID-19 therapies. It is also to reiterate facts on safety and efficacy of vaccines, and also to provide alternatives to vaccinations as an, op as an option against uh, the fight of COVID-19. We've got such an exciting and, and interesting uh, expert panel, which comprises of uh, Dr. Boitumelo, who is the CEO of the South African Health Products Regulatory. We also have Prof. Helen Rees, who is the chair of SAPRA and the founder and executive director of WHO, um, WH, 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 RHI. And then she's also at the board of the South African Health Products uh, Regulatory Authority, and she chairs WHO Afro Region Immunization Technical Advisory. We've got Prof. Andrew Parrish, she's the head of internal medicine at uh, Walter Sisulu, nice senior and camera. She's also the co-chair of the National Essential Medicines List Committee. And then lastly, we've got Dr. Jeremy Nail. She's a specialist physician and infectious disease specialist and head of infectious disease at Helen Josephs and Vets University. She he is also a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. So he'll also give, he will also give uh, perspectives on, 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 on COVID-19 uh, therapies. So to start us off, uh, maybe it's worth mentioning that we've got a Q&A. We'll ask participants to put their questions on the Q&A chat. We will collate those questions, direct them to the relevant, uh, to the relevant panelists. And at the end of the session, we'll, there will be time for a question and answer session and I've put this at the end so that we, we allow the speakers to go through the points that they need to put through and then we'll have that session. To start at us off is we are going to have uh, the, the CEO of SAPRA, Dr. Boitumelo. Dr. Boitumelo, over to you. Thank you so much, Busiso. I just wanna make sure you can see my slides. Can you just yes, come from the Yes, we can see the slides. Is it good? Yeah. Yes, it's good. 
Thank you so much, everyone. And again, um, we welcome all of you to this webinar. And you will see, um, you know, as the regulator, that our intention is to have more of these regulators, more of these webinars, so that we can continue to educate the public on very important work that we do, but also any important updates that come through from the regulator. Today, a large um, focus of what we will be talking around, you will see, is around therapeutics. We spent a lot of time on vaccines, and we will touch on that. But we thought we use this opportunity to engage with you on COVID-19 therapies. But before I do so, um, we've been getting a question um, around the different types of mechanisms that we utilize to authorize products. And I thought I'll just use this opportunity to just take you through these. The first mechanism, and, and all of these are guided by our Medicines and Related Substances Act. So you will see that we continuously say section 21 um, access, and it basically means it's access being made available with compliance to that part of the act. So if we look at this, the first level of, of um, authorization, there's basically three types of pathways that we utilize. The first pathway indicated in gray is section 21. Now, this is a mechanism that SAPRA utilizes to authorize medicines, and it's not only limited to medicines, as well as medical devices and IVDs, which are not registered by the authority. However, based on clinical data, there is a need for it. So the applicant would typically be a healthcare professional or it would be the Department of Health, wherein there's minimum sets of data that's available. And based on that data, they ask that we um, approve a certain medicine. And when we do provide that authorization, we make it available for a specific period. It would be for a specified person, so in our general um, instances, um, you know, the healthcare professional will even give us the details of the patient and say, I would like to access this medicine. We applied a lot, for example, with some of the oncology um, cancer treatments that are still not registered in South Africa. So it would be for a specific um, person or a specific institution. We also specify the quantities. So this is a very limited access to certain medicines. The next level indicated in a dark blue is um, emergency access. We're utilizing some of the principles um, of section 21. And this is a mechanism that we put in place to support the country as we're dealing with this public health emergency. So it is section 21 for public health emergencies. And again, um, very much specific around a, a disease being um, determined to be a public health emergency. So we applied this for COVID as it is a pandemic um, across the world that we were all uh, uh, dealing with. And this mechanism was to enable emergency access to all the vaccines, to the medicines, as well as the in vitro diagnostic tests that were made um, available during this time in addressing specifically COVID-19. Whenever we authorize um, a product under this emergency access utilizing section 21, again, it's for a specific period it's for a specified institution, and we also specify the quantities. So there is limited use of any product that we um, authorize according to this um, mechanism. And also in this case, it would be utilized only for the specific indication that we've authorized it for. Because at this point, the applicant may not have the full dossier that is required to enable them the last um, approach that I'll talk to, which is registration and what sometimes we've called market authorization. Again, this is as per section 15 of the Medicines Act. So this is where we register every medicine before it can be sold or marketed in the country. So a number of the products that you find, you know, on, 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 in, in the pharmacies that the healthcare practitioners would prescribe are typically um, registered through this mechanism. And it involves a full assessment of the registration dossier. And you can imagine under a pandemic, you don't have all that information available. And hence, across the world, all of us regulators have utilized emergency use mechanisms. So with the registration, you have you then access, you, you then have all the information that's required for the registration. Um, in this case, the product can be placed on the market. That's what typically happens with, with the registration. And there is no limit in terms of the quantities because 
we have satisfied ourselves that the, all the information that was required was made available under this full dossier. And in this case, very different to a section 21 where it can only be used for a spe specified indication. There are instances where we may have registered a drug for a specific indication, but based on scientific data that the healthcare professional may have or the Department of Health may have, that has not been made available to us as a regulator to extend the indication, they can then um, utilize this product outside of that regist registered indication. However, they then remain to be accountable. So the, two, the three mechanisms that we have utilized, and you'll see when I present the next two slides, these are the mechanisms that we have to make health products available. Now, in terms of um, COVID, therapies. Um, we haven't shared a lot, I think, with the public in terms of what has come in, uh, uh, but we are sitting with quite a, I think, a healthy pipeline of COVID therapies that are either in review or have already been approved. Uh, we have um, remdesivir that was approved. Again, it's a registration and with conditions, as you said, with a lot of these COVID um, therapies and the applicant here was Gilead. We also have, and that was for the originator drug, so the innovator drug. And we also have remdesivir, um, the generic form of the drug being uh, uh, registered also with conditions. Um, and this is the one from a company called Mylan. Because there's been supply um, challenges of this drug, we've also had companies that have applied for the section 21. Remember that's for a limited use, for a limited time to limited um, uh, individuals or institutions. So we have authorized a number of these under Section 21, but also those companies have submitted for registration. So these mechanisms can run in parallel because for us as a regulator, the ideal is that every product must be registered and it then uh, enables um, access and also the uh, continuous monitoring of the product by the manufacturer. There's also uh, baricitinib, um, which... Um, has also uh, uh, been authorized. Um, and this is a drug that had been registered for, under, for other indications in the past. And then these additional indications have been um, added. Last week, we communicated that we have um, authorized under Section 21. So that's for um, emergency use access for molnupiravir, um, the originator drug from um, MSD. A number of these drugs, when we evaluate the data that they make available to us, we don't only consider what has been provided, we also consider what other regulators have, um, the decisions of other regulators were able to access the reports of the assessments done by other regulators, such as the FDA and EMA, and a number of these uh, products have got emergency use access from those um, regulators. But also importantly, we consider their um, emergency use listing status by the WHO. And even in that case, we are able to access reports um, from the WHO conducted by their experts. So that's a pool of, of therapies that we have authorized. So that is remdesivir, baricitinib, as well as um, baricitinib in combination with remdesivir, as well as molnupiravir. We also have a number indicated in blue that are currently in review. Uh, we've got a combination of casirimavap and indimnivap. These are monoclonal antibodies. So what you see in, in I would call the bucket of um, uh, therapies that are currently under investigation, you find a lot of antivirals, which is the likes of remdesivir, molnupiravir, et cetera. And then we also see a class of monoclonal antibodies um, that have also then been uh, submitted. Um, so we have then the one from Roche that's currently in review. We also have a generic of Malnupirava um, that's currently in review. This is from Dr. Reddy's. We also have an Amphotericin B, which um, is a drug that is being repurposed um, for um, indications um, linked to the treatment of COVID. Again, we are reviewing that. We're seeing a number of drugs being repurposed. And this typically happens a lot um, in the sector wherein particularly the broad acting um, uh, drugs are then considered for other indications. But before it is utilized for that indication, it has to go through the regulatory um, process. 
We also have a submission of Paxlovid from uh, Pfizer that is currently um, in review, and that's a combination of two antivirals. And while there are products that we have authorized, indicated in gray, and those that we have uh, currently in review, we also have those that we have not authorized, because it is important that with every uh, product that is provided to SAPRA, we have sufficient data um, that support the uh, medical claim that is made available. And so for those that we have not authorized, it's because the data that was made available to us was not sufficient for us to confidently say it can then be utilized for that indication. And examples of that are ivermectin, bavipirivir, covalescent plasma, as well as medicinal cannabis. So we have been quite active in this area of reviewing um, therapies for the management of COVID. And just to end off, um, to give you an update again on the vaccines, um, you are aware of the number of vaccines that we have um, authorized. We've used the Section 21 emergency mechanism as well as the registration. So those that have registration, it is the Pfizer vaccine. And remember now with registration, we're not limiting the quantities anymore. Um, and you've seen that the Department of Health, even though SAPRA has not received an application for heterologous boosting, because it is now under this full registration, they can make a policy decision to make it available um, for heterologous boosting because we are satisfied um, in terms of the safety, the quality and the efficacy of this vaccine. So Pfizer has a conditional registration, the j, &J vaccine conditional registration, as well as Sinopharm from MC Farm. And with these COVID therapies, the conditions really are around monitoring, continuous monitoring of the safety of the vaccines, implementation of their risk management uh, plan, and continuous reporting to us um, as the regulator. And then lastly, that they have to continuously monitor and evaluate the vaccine efficacy of these vaccines against any emerging variants of concern. So those would be the broad um, ballpark of conditions. We also have those that have a Section 21 authorization, such as the Sinov um, Sinovac um, vaccine. And we have some that are still in review, such as Sputnik under a rolling review, and we didn't authorize the Section 21 because we had a concern around um, the safety of the vaccine. Uh, we have Sinopharm by separate applicants that is also still under review, as well as Sputnik Light and um, Covavax um, uh, submitted to us by CIPLA. So you can see, um, you know, in the midst, in, 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 in this whole bucket of tools that are being utilized for the management of our vaccines, as a regulator, we've prioritized both vaccines as well as therapies, and we also have um, medical devices as well as in vitro diagnostic tests that the team has been um, assessing. And just to conclude for now, it's to really encourage the public to take these vaccines because we continuously monitor their safety. We have our microsite uh, on our website that you can visit at any point. It indicates what are some of the adverse effects following immunization that we see, but also those adverse effects that are serious, that we're working with other colleagues to continue to monitor and see if there's any association to the vaccines. But we can say largely that the benefit of being vaccinated continues to outweigh any risk of some of these very rare side effects. Thank you very much. This is all, I'll pause here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Waitu Melo. We've heard on the requirements for COVID-19 therapies and the progress in the authorizations that have been made, and also how South Africa then works or considers several factors for the approval. We'll then move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Andy Parrish. And Dr. Andy Parrish is going to speak to the current South African recommendations for COVID-19 therapies and vaccine. Over to you, Andy. Thanks, I'm just getting my slides up. Um, here we go. Okay, I hope you can see that. Um, thanks for um, having me in this webinar. It's quite exciting seeing this combination of NIMLAC and um, the Department of Health and SAPRA on this issue. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the individual agents because Jeremy Nell will go through those. I just want to contextualize the difference between a registration decision, which is what SAPRA makes, and a purchasing decision, which is what the Department of Health does. 
And essentially on this slide, you can see some of the areas where we are um, you know, interacting with the Department of Health in various different committees. So the National Essential Medicines List Committee, which I co-chair is there on the left, and isn't really um, part of this process in terms of COVID therapeutics. There's a separate committee, which is inside that green box, which I chair also. Um, and that's the one that has been looking at the various therapeutic agents, but not the vaccines. Up until now, that's been a separate committee. Um, and uh, the two things have been running in parallel. But essentially, those both advise the minister on purchasing decisions based on our decisions about whether um, the medicine is an appropriate and affordable agent. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail now. So if you look on our website, um, the Knowledge Base Hub has got a, a little link there called COVID-19 Rapid Reviews, and there's a string of them there. Um, they basically are um, updated as new information becomes available that we think is going to change a decision. We won't update it if it's, it's new data that seems to leave us where we are, but if there's anything that might change a decision, we will. Some of these reviews have been updated five or six times as evidence comes through. And this is what one of them looks like. So basically this is a um, ivermectin one. It's got a number of pages to it, but it has a recommendation which we put in and a rationale for the recommendation. And essentially the idea should be that that allows the um, purchasing folk in the Ministry of Health's office to then decide whether or not they are going to go ahead and um, buy the drug for the country. And a number of factors come into that decision-making process. So essentially before you can say whether, when a product is registered, it's been shown to be effective and safe. We do a few more things. We decide first, and that's the PICO there, which is a um, thing about eligibility criteria in studies that we would look at. But the key point about this whole process, and I'm not gonna spend long on this slide, is that it's a, um, regimented process that's set in motion before we look at the data and it decides before we look at the data which endpoints, which things we regard as clinically important. Is it mortality? Is it hospital admission? Whatever it might be. And that then is firmly used in searching for studies, in screening which studies to actually look at extracting data and appraising and synthesizing the evidence and producing a final report. So this is how we change um, the evidence that we get into a decision. And it's got a framework to it. And this is a fairly regimented framework, which we feel is quite important. The point about it is it is in the public domain. So if you look at those reviews, you'll find this data at the end of those reviews, where we've tried to explain how we turn something from simply being effective. So there might be clear um, data enough to make a product registrable by SAPRA, which uh, shows that something works. But if we find that the um, clinical benefit is relatively small, if the side effects outweigh the benefits in our um, opinion, or if there are other issues such as um, we are uncertain about the quality of the evidence. We are um, unsure about whether we've got the resources or, um, available, whether there's cost effectiveness issues, acceptability issues. There's a whole bunch of these things coming to consideration whether to go ahead and recommend purchasing. And also we, as I've just already said, we will re-look at these things if there's either new evidence of efficacy, new evidence of harm, or new evidence the cost has changed and that would affect cost effectiveness. Just a, a couple of words on repurposing of medicines. Now, this has been a subject that's been around for decades, and there's a whole, those of us who are epidemiologists delight in looking at this stuff. And in fact, the um, sort of batting average for repurposed medicines is extremely low. It doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, but um, if you're gonna be a betting person and you look at a bunch of repurposed medicines for a new thing, particularly antiviral um, type indications, the chances are it's gonna, not perform terribly well. Be that as it may, there's a lot of agents we've had to look at and we've tried our best to be as um, sensible about them as possible. And the bottom line of it is that um, corticosteroids came in early as worthwhile. And apart from that, very really little else has been um, enthusiastically received as something we need to buy for the country. 
for the indication of treating COVID or preventing COVID. Um, the other thing to just mention is evidence evolution. And I think that's important for people who have links to the press and um, to social media sites. You know, um, when registration data is first made available to published papers or published data, um, but frequently when these products are moving so fast, uh, the newer ones, uh, that data is not yet in the public domain. The companies release um, press releases, um, which are um, always treated with some skepticism because they will release the findings which are most um, in support of their product being brilliant. And um, those may well be um, where the effect um, benefits has had a significant change to our enthusiasm for it. And those have had um, major problems with it. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But the ideal, the thing that we base our published reviews on um, is uh, peer reviewed published articles. So when getting around to making a purchasing decision, we have issues around the certainty of the evidence. If we um, wait for it to be really sure, we may miss the opportunity to use a drug on a lot of, med of people. Um, we also may lose our place in a purchasing queue and find that there's none left when we finally get around to doing it. And obviously we have social enthusiasms which we have to balance against these things. So just as a quick, um, really very quick um, reminder of the danger of preprint um, papers, the ivermectin thing is full of it. Two of the preprints have had to um, disappear from our um, radar now one because it was probably fraudulent, another which had such obvious errors in it that it makes one wonder about the same issue. But certainly um, the peer reviewers make a big difference to these papers and they hadn't happened yet. So um, you know, fanfares about papers appearing in preprint should be treated with a lot of caution. Um, the issue around um, safety mechanisms in science is there for a reason. There's a reason why lots of other scientists should look at a paper before it is just accepted as true. And that's part of the process that SAPRA follows, but also process that we follow at the EML. So, um, you know, this is just showing the um, Prof. Andy, we sometimes struggle to hear you. And if you look at all the studies in red there, this has come out, was published by Andrew Hill, and that was being as um, effective. Yeah, it's my connection. I'm, can you hear me now? Yes, can hear you better now. Maybe you can switch off the camera to save to some bandwidth. All right, I'll switch off the video. That might help. Okay, so the issue then is that the effect size has now drifted towards null. And um, I think that that's quite an important um, point for us. So I'm, I'm going to just end off now um, and then leave it up to Jeremy to tell you a bit about the individual agents. But really just a summary is that um, medication registration is about safety and efficacy. And it doesn't necessarily mean the state will regard it as a sensible purchase because they are taking into account all these other criteria which are quantifying the actual size of the benefit, um, equity issues, implementability, cost effectiveness and affordability. And obviously as an essential medicines group, we don't want to put a whole bunch of products to do exactly the same on um, tender when we could deal with just one. So I think I'll leave it there and then it's up to Jeremy to carry on. Thanks very much. All right. uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Andy. And as you have rightly mentioned, we will then uh, hand it over to Dr. Jeremy Nell. Over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to be really brief and just talk about some of the topical uh, therapies which this uh, NIMLEC uh, uh, COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee has looked at recently. Um, this is the kind of therapeutic landscape upon which I think there's a reasonable amount of, of consensus uh, in the world. This is not all available here. I've just highlighted in various colors uh, what this group has looked at um, in terms of recommendations for or against. 
and then those for which there's no recommendation yet. Um, you, you've met some of the monoclonal antibodies um, in the SAPRA CEO's first presentation. Um, they're not yet, none of them are yet registered in the country. They haven't been assessed by, uh, by our group, um, but they are always vulnerable. And one of the big downsides to them is they're very vulnerable to new variants because they all target the spike protein. And in fact, for example, with Omicron, which is circulating currently, only this uh, citrovimab is actually expected to be um, efficacious. Um, but that's roughly where you have, like I said, we don't have monoclonals in the, in the country. We're currently assessing some of the oral antivirals. Um, whether or not remdesivir has a, a role to play, at least, um, um, is one that's been re-looked at by the, our committee at the moment, but um, I think is, is still going to have significant problems if used early because of its intravenous use. And so what I'm really going to concentrate is some of the other ones that we've looked at. Um, tocilizumab is is very, very um, uh, topical. It certainly had headlines after the corticosteroids. It was the next big agent to show um, any real efficacy. And it took the recovery trial, a very big trial centered around the UK, uh, to show that benefit, really. A number of smaller trials had come out, which didn't appear to show significant benefit. Um, if you look at the, the evidence for the efficacy overall, you can see here, this is a good way of putting it. It's a very intuitive way of putting it, which is why I quite like this way of doing it. For every thousand people you treat, the best estimate is that um, if you don't use tocilizumab and you give them normal standard of care, about 133 of those patients will die out of the thousand. If you do use tocilizumab, about 114 of those will die. That gives a relative effect of 0.88. In other words, there's a 12% uh, reduction relatively in mortality when seen. And this is the confidence interval over here at the bottom where it stretches from 0.81 to 0.95. So that's a 19% to a 5% reduction in mortality uh, as a 95% confidence interval. And if you look at adverse events, you can see, in fact, they were pretty much very similar. This confidence interval actually goes above one and, and down to 0.75. In other words, there was no statistically significant difference in adverse effects, but there was a reduction in mortality. That reduction in mortality as an absolute terms is relatively small. It's about a 3.5% reduction in mortality. Um, and what that means, if you try and translate that into a number needed to treat, which is a more intuitive way of, of understanding it, it means that you'd need to treat about 29 people to prevent one death. That confidence interval stretches from 18 people to 67 people. Um, and that's the sort of range around, we can, around which we can be reasonably confident that the true value lies. So that's a, an overview of, of, the, of the drug. So then why, for example, did we not recommend it uh, at, the, at the NIMLEC level? And at the, at the for the for the COVID nineteen therapeutics, and remember, this is really targeted um, primarily at the state, although there's implications across the country, even in the private sector too. Um, the big reason was the affordability of the agent. It is expensive; it costs many thousands of rands um, per dose, um, and that translated into a very large total budgetary impact and also a cost effectiveness per life save, um, which didn't fall within the usual range, um, which the state can afford it. And this is a really a key point in that, and Professor Parrish mentioned this already, in that there's a, there's a big difference between assessing something purely on evidence and putting all these other considerations in. Um, there were some other concerns about it. It's an intravenous agent. So we prefer oral agents, it's easy to give, but that's not a big consideration. And there's also equity concerns. We, we know that there's very limited supply globally of this drug, in fact, South Africa ran out of it recently um, due to its use in COVID-19. And then there would be concerns about equity across between public and private uh, uh, sectors um, around that as well. So that was a conditional re recommendation against, but really not doubting in, in any significant way the efficacy, but really a an, an recommendation that was to, it taken into account all these other factors that we mentioned. How about baricitinib? That's a new drug as well. Uh, well, not a new drug, but a new COVID drug. It's a Janus kinase inhibitor, it's a JAK2 inhibitor. Um, and again, this is shown in uh, a, really now a number of studies, but there was one in particular that the Nemelec group looked at. This has actually taken this image from the WHO's uh, living guideline on drugs, uh, just to give you some sense of the numbers because they looked at two trials and we looked at one because we were a bit more strict and the trial entry criteria are slightly different, but it gives you a good sense. They're really very, very close to each other. This again, per thousand people treated, it suggests that your mortality would shift from 130 per thousand to 85, which is 45 fewer per thousand and moderate level of certainty in that estimate there. Uh, some decrease in the mechanical ventilation and in the duration as well of ventilation and time to clinical stability. So we recommended for its use uh, conditionally, 
in the uh, in the NEMLAC process. And again, this was really based on the fact that it was more affordable than tocilizumab. Um, it is also an oral agent, which helps us because you can give it in a wider variety of settings. Um, but we do acknowledge some concerns still about access um, to the drug and about equity concerns between private and public, and even in fact, between provinces within the state, given that the budget is often uh, required at a provincial level rather than the national level. But it gives you some sense of how two drugs, tocilizumab and baricitimab, which are, have fairly close uh, estimates of efficacy um, and really are, are filling the same kind of niche. One was recommended, but not the other. And again, this is again, looking at the total budgetary impact as well um, for their use. This was effectively a cheaper option, which we're doing some, something very, very similar. And then the last of the three drugs I wanna mention is Monupyrever. This is a drug which is an oral antiviral. Um, so this is one of the, this is a, a drug which could be given early in disease, in fact, has to be given early in disease to prevent complications developing. So that's the chief role in terms of where the evidence lies at the moment. So you take a high risk individual, not every individual, but a high risk individual at risk of developing severe COVID. And the theory would go, you'd give them the drug and then they would be at a lower, rate, a lower risk of developing these complications. In the trial that was done, there's really only one randomized control trial for this outpatient setting at the moment. Um, and that, um, with at least one published one. And that sh showed that with placebo, about 9.7% of these people developed uh, hospitalization or death. And in fact, it was almost all hospitalization, it was only one death. Um, and then Molnupirava in the arm that that, that group took, it reduced that to about 6.8. So that's, uh, you can see a relatively smallish decline. Adverse events, there um, not a huge amount of difference between the two of them. So it was, you got about a 3% reduction in hospitalization, again, that's very different from death. This is hospitalization or death, but almost all of them were hospitalizations. So our group has looked at this and recommended conditionally against its use. So again, why? Well, one thing to important, sorry, one very important thing is that it, again, it's hospitalizations that we're looking at. We, this is a 3% reduction, not so much in death, but really predominantly in hospitalization. You're giving these to people who are relatively well to start with. So you're really unlikely to ever see a big mortality benefit. Um, most importantly, again, the study was done in unvaccinated patients, so we can anticipate that the benefit may well be a lot smaller in vaccinated people because they would be offered protection from the vaccine, and possibly also in those with previous infection, although that again is, is a relatively unknown at the moment. There's some other uh, logistic complications to this drug. It has to be given early, so we're really within the first five days of developing symptoms. Um, which means that you have to go and get tested and, and be known to have COVID and then go and get the medication all within the first five days, which can be challenging. Um, and then it's only for high risk individuals as well. So this is not for the general, general population who are at very low risk of complications. And so one of the concerns uh, is that there's a high risk of what we call indication creep. In other words, you would authorize this drug at a say, local clinic level and then um, everyone would get it, even if they weren't high risk and even if they weren't within the first five days, which would uh, cost a huge amount of money and not provide the benefit that, that you would require. Um, and the affordability is roughly in the same ballpark as baricitinib. Uh, and so that, again, I hope gives you some sense of, of um, well, why these recommendations for or against are made independently of the SAPRA process, which is really where it starts in terms of the regulatory aspect. There are further considerations which uh, need to be done in terms of the Department of Health level. And then very lastly, um, this is one of the drugs which you may have heard, it goes by the brand name Paxlovid. It's Nermatrelvir with Rishtanavir as well. It's another antiviral. Uh, it's being assessed currently. It was only published in the New England Journal uh, last week, um, but it's being assessed um, currently by this group and we hope to have an answer relatively soon. But again, it's really offering the same sort of, uh, offering to play in the same sort of space that Molnupiravir does. In other words, it's another oral antiviral. It would have to be given early in the therapeutic course and we'd have to worry about things like indication creep, et cetera, because it would only really be for the high risk individuals. But we haven't yet come to an agreement on this that's still being uh, discussed and debated and really the evidence at the stage pulled, but hopefully soon we'll have a recommendation one way or the other on that too. And I'm going to leave it there, I think, but just I hope that's given you some overview of the flavor of what sort of considerations are taken in uh, under by this group. And again, this fairly rigorous process that safeguards the, the recommendations from um, going astray. Uh, thanks very much. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh...
Thank you so much, Dr. Jeremy. I think uh, we will have Prof. Helen Rees to bring it all together and also speak to global recommendations on the use of therapies for the management of COVID-19. That being said, I'll still encourage everyone to continue to putting uh, questions into the Q&A box. And then after Prof. Helen Rees has spoken, we'll then uh, go on to the questions for the different panelists. Over to you, Prof. Helen. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just summarize what you just heard in terms of who, who's who making what decisions. So you heard from Tumi that SAPRA makes the regulatory decisions. In terms of the therapeutics, we just heard from Andy and, and Jeremy that the, uh, the special committee, the NEMLEC COVID committee, makes recommendations on the therapeutics. The, we haven't spoken so much about it, but we have a ministerial advisory committee on vaccines that makes recommendations similar to those you've just seen about how the NEMLEC committee works, but on the vaccines. And they use a similar approach to reviewing the data. So it is not the same as a regulatory approach. Uh, in addition, we have one other sort of consensus uh, group, which are looking at vaccine safety in particular, which is both SAPRA together with a ministerial at, uh, a committee, which looks at vaccine safety and the Department of Health. And then as was said, it's the Department of Health who takes that final decision about whether they are or are not going to be able to introduce a particular product. So that's the sort of the local situation. But if we go to the, the global situation, how does this uh, compare? Well, one of the, obviously the front runners and one of the, the sort of reference groups that we look at is the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization, similar to what I've just described, has a group that looks at things from a regulatory perspective, and then they have other groups that look at the data from a more policy perspective, as you've just seen from the NEMLEC committee. Um, from the um, regulatory pers perspective, there's a regulatory group, and they look in the context of an emergency, which is clearly the pandemic. So it has to be in the context of this emergency situation. They look at emergency use listing and they look at both therapeutics and they look at vaccines as well. Um, and they will do the same sort of process that you've just heard, but they're obviously thinking globally. So for example, at the moment, they have 10 vaccines that have been approved. And just as Tumi was showing locally that we have sometimes the same vaccine applied for from different applicants that could be a generic, it could be something different like that. And similarly, they, they at WHO also will look at vaccines in the same manner. So they'll, they have 10 vaccines and they have a number of therapeutics also approved. Um, so that's the EUL process and that's the regulatory process. But in parallel to that, they have committees that look at the policy side of therapeutics and do the same kind of um, description as we've just heard from the NEMLEC saying, Here, here's the, the data from a policy perspective, do we recommend this or not? And very early on, something as, as, as commonly used now as steroids was one of their early recommendations. Um, so they do that for therapeutics and they also do it through another committee called SAGE for vaccines, which looks at the vaccines through the lens of policy. Um, and it looks at the evidence and it looks at policy. So that's the, the global framework up there. But the other groups that we also have reference to and SAPRA and all of the committees locally will look at are other regulatory authorities. And we've heard them mentioned, the well-resourced regulatory authorities, such as the FDA, the European Medicines Agency. Uh, they are often the very early authorities that applicants will go to with a new product or a repurposed product for approval. And so they'll often have looked at the data before it would come into South Africa, for example, and will be making recommendations. But we would also look at a group like the US CDC uh, which also looks at the data and thinks about health services. So we do a scan of all sorts of global uh, approvals and recommendations, which uh, doesn't determine what we do, but certainly assists us. Um, so th that's really the, the sort of the global um, architecture that we have at the moment. Uh, 
The safety of vaccines is something that comes up very frequently. And one other group that we work very closely with, again from WHO, is what's called GACS, which is the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety. And we work with that committee and with other regulatory authorities globally to look at vaccine safety. As you can understand with vaccines, you get a certain amount of safety data from these large phase three clinical trials where you might have 30,000, 40,000 people enrolled. But when you roll out vaccines to millions of people and it's a new disease and it's a new vaccine, you might get rare side effects uh, that you'll only pick up if you're scanning really hundreds of thousands of people and you're doing it worldwide. And for that reason, it's very important, particularly for vaccine safety, but in fact, for all therapeutic safety, that we work very closely with WHO and with other regulatory authorities. And we do that and we collectivize the data that's emerging around particularly vaccine safety. So um, that's, that's the sort of the global architecture. Um, and when you see the recommendations from the NEMLEC, from VMAC, et cetera, you'll see that in the references that you'll see very often references to um, other regulatory authorities or other guidelines uh, which have been referred to in making these decisions. Um, I'll stop there. I see there are quite a lot of questions in the Q&A that uh, I think it would be good to have some time to come back to. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. I think at this point, uh, we will. I'll just be asking the panelists a few of the few of the questions that uh, that 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 are, that are coming up, and um, I think I'll start with uh, Boitumelo. Uh, these, uh, I think, the first question I'll ask is uh, the first question that we have for you is how can Pfizer Pfizer's combinatory receive full registration without uh, full preclinical studies as per SAPRA guidelines. And is it also in phase three trials throughout the developed countries? That's the, that's the first question. Thank you. Uh, I've been going through the questions and if you don't mind, uh, so the, I think the first 11 or so are to SAPRA. So I'm happy to, to tackle those all at once, if, if that's no, okay. No, no, and I'll I think keep it brief. Fine because there's quite a lot that's, that's coming. Quite a lot. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief and SAPRA always continues to be available for other engagements. So okay. let me address the questions related to, to, to Pfizer. So Pfizer received a initially a section 21 authorization because there was uh, data that was still required. And um, typically the additional type of data we need is for um, more studies on the efficacy, the vaccine efficacy, and it would then be uh, vaccine effectiveness studies that they would then provide us wherein they're looking when the vaccine is being rolled out, what are some of the, what are the efficacy results against a variant of concern, but also the safety results as these are being rolled out. And you can imagine a lot of these have now generated quite a lot of safety data as these vaccines have been um, rolled out in the different countries. So that's what we considered. We must also mention that when we make a decision as SAPRA, we don't only consider data conducted in South Africa. We look at data that is generated um, elsewhere, particularly um, when the studies are as per the international guidelines of how one generates um, that data. So that's why those that do have a um, conditional registration being Sinopharm, J&J and Pfizer were satisfied with the safety um, data and the efficacy data. Another question around Pfizer was um, for the five to 11 year old, we have received an application, um, I think as early as last week or so. So it's still at the very, very early stages of, um, of evaluation. And then there was a question around um, safety and which institution is responsible or is the custodian of, of safety data. So as Helen mentioned, there's a number of institutions. Firstly, SAPRA, we, we are responsible to monitor um, together with the applicants all the safety data pertaining to vaccines. So we've got the Med Safety app and we have it also on our website. And there's a paper-based format that's available at the various um, sites that one can complete and report um, on the vaccine safety. We work very closely with the National Immunization Safety Expert Committee um, that assist us um, you know, with the assessment of these um, adverse effects, um, particularly as we assess whether they are 
causality linked to the vaccine or not. And this committee also has similar um, committees at provincial level. So it, it is a team that um, you know, works across these spheres um, to, to review that. And we also look at data generated um, you know, in other countries and what other regulators have indicated. Then there was a question around section 21, whether the name patient falls off, definitely not. So in our current um, approach for all the other medicines, um, name patient is still important. And that's that first gray pillar that I indicated that it is for a specific individual or a specific um, institution. So that remains to be. For COVID, we have made it you know, um, limited the quantities. And you can imagine with the numbers of those that are accessing this, it cannot be on a patient by pace basis. So we have different tiers. We authorize the one, the, the, the licensed entity that brings in the bulk stock, the institutions that hold um, this bulk stock. And then um, we've, you may have seen it for Remdesivir, wherein there was a retrospective application for then the, the patients that would access um, the drug through their healthcare practitioners. And then just the last two questions I'll talk to, which is around self-testing. And um, it is a topic um, that, that's quite important, a matter that's quite important. And we've been working um, you know, with various stakeholders on this. What you will see um, in the coming weeks or so is a position um, by Sapram. We already have some products that um, are in application. It is important that we align with our global partners in terms of the required target profile, because the last thing we want is to authorize products that will have a high false negative or high, high false positivity rate. So the target um, profile, pro product profile is important and very soon we will communicate. I know that the Department of Health is also looking into this through other structures so that there's a very clear national guideline on the use of self-testing. So there's a lot of work um, taking place in, in that area and communication will go out soon. And then in terms of the facilities that host, um, that keep these vaccines, all of them are licensed by SAPRAM and our inspectors go out to make sure that there is compliance with the cold chain requirements for the vaccines that do um, require that. And then lastly on ivermectin, um, there was no formal application, but you know, many of you have seen that there was a lot of call by various um, you know, entities to say SAPRAM must authorize it. Remember also this was a drug that at the time was not registered for human use. So it could not, uh, we needed the data to indicate that it can, it is safe, it's a quality and an effective product. It was only for veterinary sectors. It has been approved, but for topical formulation. And we do have an application uh, for, for, for the registration of this, but not for COVID. And so we continue to assess the, the, the data. And as um, you know, Jeremy indicated, and, 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 and Andy also indicated that there's a lot of what um, you know, uh, those who were for ivermectin were relying on that now have been shown to be studies that had significant gaps to a point where they are recalled. So for now, it's being available through a compassionate access program, but we're reviewing all of these um, data. As we've said, we will review the data as it emerges. And off late, there's been a lot of data emerging on ivermectin and SAPRA will communicate its decision on um, ivermectin. I'll pause here. I think I've covered all the questions that were directed to SAPRA, at least for now. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samete. Um, I think I see there's quite a number of other questions as you're talking that have come through the chat. And as you look through them, I'll go to uh, Jeremy. Uh, there's a question on, do we have any idea on what the price of Paxlovid uh, will be? And then uh, it goes on to say, uh, that's from Geraldine, and she says, I've read that there may be a differentiated price for middle and low-income countries. If so, would South Africa qualify for this? Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to respond to that. Uh, sure, and, and others on this call may be able to chip in um, to supplement my answer. Uh, but in, in essence, no, we don't. We don't know the price yet. Um, it's it's not yet obviously registered through through SAPRA. It's being being looked at by SAPRA, um, and that's the Pfizer originator molecule. Um, the, the Pfizer did st uh, sign a, an agreement with the medicines patent pool to promote its use in low and middle income countries, as you rightly said. Um, that application would be in theory separate as far as I'm aware, and then may come with restrictions such as, for example, it may only be able to sold in the state sector, for example, and not by the private sector. 
Um, but we don't unfortunately have a, a clear answer in terms of price in, in for, for either, either avenue. Um, it's possible others on this call will know more or will maybe be able to supplement that answer too. So if anyone wants to jump in, please do. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists would want to, but I see that we, we have five minutes and we still have quite a number of other questions. Prof. Helen Rees, there is one that's specific for you, which says, uh, which is from Philip. Says, is there a pathway that enables SAPRA to lend its expertise and technical support to other regulatory mechanisms in the SADC region? And then continues to say, WHO and Africa CDC, we initially promoted regulatory harmonization to support to support uh, countries with weak regulatory mechanisms, would appreciate your view. Over to you, Prof. Yes, and um, this is this is this has been topical for quite a long time, but I mean, COVID has really brought this into very sharp focus. So it's a very good question. Clearly, um, the South African Regulatory Authority is more mature and better resourced than many other regulatory authorities in in the region. And the way that this is being sort of objectively analyzed for all regulatory authorities now is by the World Health Organization that are looking at what's called maturity levels. And there's one to four with four being the highest maturity level. Um, and, and that's being preferred. Some of you might have heard the language stringent regulatory authorities, which are the FDAs and the EMAs and the British, et cetera. And, and that this language is preferred to that because it's a, it's a much more objective and then less emotive piece of language to describe how far along and how mature um, a regulatory authority is. So South Africa is in the process of, of getting that maturity level assessment undertaken and other African regulators are also doing it. But in parallel to that, there has been for some time, particularly sub-regional groups that are working together to do collective evaluations of, of products. Um, a very well-known one um, which in the region, which is called Avareth, um, has looked particularly at, at vaccine uh, approvals and came into the fore when the Ebola outbreak was there, where many countries in the West African region, both regulators and ethics committees combined to look at clinical trials and then later on to look at uh, registration of, of, of products, both therapeutics and vaccines. So, so the answer is yes, certainly in the region, there are big efforts, but globally there are also um, efforts as well. There's um, a, a collective um, coalition of regulatory authorities, which again with COVID has really come together to look at how data sharing can continue. In the African region, there's now very serious discussion of an African medicines agency, which would be parallel to the European medicines agency, something similar. Um, it's at the early stages of development, so it's not yet in a mature state to say definitely this is the timeline, this is what it will do. Um, but there's a lot of global interest in this. It's getting support from the African CDC and from WHO. And um, some of the big bilateral donors have committed to putting a lot of money into an African medicines agency. And the idea there would be to have um, a regional coalition of regulators so that we can start to get harmonization of approvals. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Helen Reis. We are almost at, on, at time, but one last question from uh, Asia Abdul Karim, uh, possibly to yourself or way to Melo. And the question is uh, regarding efficacy evaluation of therapeutics. And it says, when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines, the efficacy baseline was set at 50%. Is there a similar guideline for COVID-19 treatments? And additionally, could you please explain how Monopiravir meets the baseline for efficacy with the 30% difference between those receiving the drug versus the placebo. I think that would be the last question. And I think after that response, probably each panelist will have a minute just to wrap up because we're at, at on time already. I don't know about you, Melo, or well, yes, over to you, Melo. Thank you. So, I mean, indeed, um, you know, for vaccines, we did have that. But again, for the therapies, because of the different types of therapies, um, you know, that, that has not been communicated um, as yet. We're still in deliberation on, you know, the antivirals, um, the MABs, um, et cetera. And also a lot of these drugs have a very different mode of action. Um, and some, as you may have seen, are used in combination. So it, it probably would be a lot more complex to provide um, than it was the case for, um, for, for, for vaccines. 
But you also note, I think you may have seen this when, when Jeremy was presenting is um, the stages of um, you know, disease um, stages um, that these drugs are kind of targeting. And in this case, it is for mild, early mild disease. Um, and in that case, the other consideration is about what else is available. And hence, these are for emergency um, use access because while we have vaccines, we do also need to have um, therapies that are utilized um, for the management of the disease. So there's a number of factors that are being um, considered. Um, and then the other question linked to that was whether we do apply reliance. And yes, uh, we get reports from the FDA, from EMA. In some instances, it's submitted uh, with the application. So we get to see what other international um, experts um, have looked at and their, their reports um, on the data that was um, provided. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, I think at this point, I'll just give each of the panelists a minute to just uh, give their closing remarks. I'll start with Andy, then Jeremy, then Dr. Uh, Tumelo, then finally, Prof. Helen Ruth. So about you, Andy. No, thank you. And, and thanks for the opportunity to present at this webinar. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to say a lot. I think that the key message we've got is that there's a, a differentiation between SAPRA's approval of a medicine in terms of registration, which basically says that they are um, comfortable that it's effective and safe, and the Department of Health's approval of a medicine, which takes a whole lot of other values and criteria into consideration. So that's probably why there's sometimes a discord between people's understanding of registration and availability, and certainly in the state sector. The public um, sector probably sets um, some um, guidelines in terms of other purchasing in the private sector, but um, when medicines really are marginally effective, although effective enough to register, there are a lot of other considerations which would guide whether we would finally agree to purchasing. And these purchasing decisions can be huge. You know, some of the ones, I won't go into individual drugs, but for certain of the drugs we considered, um, the uh, yearly um, purchase for the country would have been of the order of 100 million rands per product. So these aren't trivial decisions we're making. And um, that's why we've tried to provide a robust um, framework for it and also make that, put that in the public domain so people can actually query it, disagree with it, write to us if they disagree or if they think we've made a mistake and allow us to um, you know, re-look at things if they need to be looked at. But the main um, final point is that the evidence has been evolving so rapidly for so many of these products that it is a moving field, literally, which has been a delight working in, but it's not an easy space to be too dogmatic in. I think we can be getting closer and closer to being dogmatic about certain products like ivermectin. Though. So, you know, uh, observational studies showing um, linkage between um, dropping rates and ivermectin use are um, really losing any credibility when compared to the um, controlled trial data, which is getting closer and closer to um, convincing null effect. Thank you. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Prof. Andy. Over to you, uh, Prof. Jeremy. Uh, sure, and thanks very much. Thanks to SAPRA and uh, and thanks to uh, to all the people who, who joined the webinar as well. Too. It's a good opportunity for us to explain some of the rationales and just really briefly to, to echo uh, Professor Parrish's comments. This is a very, very, very transparent process on our part. It's uh, these rec recommendations are done with intensive kind of uh, looking through the evidence and this is published online in publicly available spots within really within days usually of a recommendation and we do welcome feedback um, that's constructive and there are mechanisms for that so thank you all and I hope that we've given you some some kind of insight into how these processes are made thanks Dr. Samete, then uh, Prof. Helen. thank you and just um, firstly to thank Park um, for uh, working with us and hosting this webinar and thanks to all the 146 odd um, people that have joined it, it really demonstrate the needs for the continuous engagement on, on such topics. And then just to also say that from a SAPRA perspective, um, you know, for us, it is, it is important that our decisions um, based on scientific evidence, and that's something that we, could, we will continuously um, implement. And as we engage with the public, we will share with you in terms of what science we consider and how we arrive at certain decisions. So I hope this was very helpful um, until we have the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Um, well, perhaps I'll, I'll just add to what Tumi has just said. I think that the one thing that COVID has shown us is, is the importance of having evidence-based decisions and this sort of continuum from regulatory through to policy. Um, from the regulatory point of view, it's very important that we look at safety, quality, efficacy, and it's evidence-based, and that we can justify any decisions taken, which is why some of these questions were really excellent. Um, but uh, in addition, it, it, if, if we cannot take into account other things, so the importance of having an independent regulator who just sticks to this mandate quite strictly, but Increasingly, we are hoping to become more and more transparent. Um, that wasn't the way of the old Medicines Control Council. The legislation was framed in a different way. But the, the modern thinking the, is now to have much more transparency and dialogue for, for regulatory authorities. So with that, I think we would want to thank PATH very much for working with us to, to have this seminar. Thank you. Right, uh, I think from my and thank you, Prof. Helen Rees. I think from part side, we're grateful to be a partner to SAPRA, but also we're grateful for the effort that SAPRA is putting in terms of ensuring that there's transparency in terms of the regulatory processes. And also it's, it's also helping not just South Africa, but it's also helping the African continent as we move forward. And with that being said, uh, thank you everyone for being part of this. Uh, let's, we look forward to further engagements and deliberations on similar issues. Have a wonderful day, thank you.